Castillo, and with me as always is Tim Anais, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. How are you, Tim? I am good. How are you? Fine, thank you. So, so friends, we're going to keep our opening short because this podcast is, is a recording of our, our luncheon speaker, Gordon Chang. So many of our listeners followed Gordon Chang's work or know of him because he's a, he's in great demand in the media for, for his analysis and, and his commentary on China, as well as all, all of the books he's written. And it was a great privilege for us to to host him both in Southern California and in Northern California. And he, Mr. Chang came all the way to California just to be with uh, PRI's audiences. So we're grateful. But before we do that, Tim, you have to fill us in on the twists and turns at the assembly on the speakership. Folks, we thought it was all over, but apparently not. Just when you thought we had decided it and there was white smoke, well, it turns out, what is it? Is there's black smoke when there isn't a Pope elected. But, you know, we had rumblings in the last week that Assemblyman Joaquin Arambula, who is so-called moderate Democrat from the Central Valley, announced that, quote, he had been approached to consider the speakership. That, of course, is a ruse, right? Every legislator wakes up in the morning and looks in the mirror and sees a president or a, or a speaker, uh, certainly. But recall there was the very divisive speakership battle that played out over the last year between incumbent Speaker Anthony Rendon and his would-be challenger Assemblyman Robert Rivas from um, the Hollister area. And it played out all year, and they reached a deal in November that Speaker Rendon would continue as Speaker until June 30th, and then Mr. Rivas would become Speaker. And there was seemingly unanimity and and everybody uh, excited in the Democratic caucus and that they had gotten over a very divisive time uh, for them. Well, clearly not that you have, you know, someone else stepping forward. You can always replace a Speaker as long as you have 41 votes on the floor. The whole House elects the Speaker. So even if there are some dissenting voices among the Democrats, well, if there are enough of them to deny 41 votes, that's what matters here. Now, our friend Steve Maviglio is a past guest on our podcast, and he does um, press and communications for Mr. Rivas. Um, he says it's game over. We're, we're, we're done. Well, we're going to see, you know, is this kind of a vanity effort by one or two last holdouts? Or is it, uh, you know, a legitimate thing that, you know, we're going to see another real fight this spring? One important thing to note, of course, is that this better be a serious effort if you're coming after the speaker designate, or you're going to find yourself in the smallest office in the Capitol. Maybe the Capitol cafeteria will be your new office. And all of a sudden, you're going to have the worst committee assigned and, you know, any chairmanship that you have will probably be stripped. So a, a lot at play here. But, you know, the adage, if you're going to come for the king, you best not miss really is true here. And if you want to see all of this go on in person, then you should come with us Join us in Sacramento on February 15th for our fifth annual California Ideas in Action Policy Conference that'll be taking place just a block from the state capitol. We have a terrific lineup of, of speakers. We're going to explore, you know, how can we plan an urban comeback in California? We have Keith Knopp, the president and CEO of Rayleigh's, as our luncheon speaker, and Michael Schellenberger, the national best-selling author of San Francisco, is our closing speaker. And you can explore the town and see if you can and, uh, pick up on any intrigue in many of the watering holes around town. So join us. Uh, thanks to the generosity our, of our donors. It's a, a free event. So, But register now at pacificresearch.org slash events because tickets are going fast. We only have a few spots remaining and time is running out to register. Thanks for that, Tim. And we'll watch this all unfold. And thanks everyone for listening. So here's Gordon Chang. Well, thank you so much, Rowena. And thank you all for coming here today. The topic is China, but I first want to put that country into the context of recent developments. Today, the world is changing faster than our ability to understand it. And that means, among other things, that probably some of our assumptions are obsolete. And as a result, we may not comprehend the danger. It feels like we have just passed an historic inflection point transitioning from a period of general calm to one of constant turbulence. And in this new era, war can spread from Ukraine, both east and west across the Eurasian landmass, and perhaps the North Africa as well. 
And these days, war can cause unimaginable devastation. Vladimir Putin has been threatening to use his nuclear weapons. He has a doctrine which has been called escalate to de-escalate or escalate to win, which is threatening or maybe even using nuclear weapons early in a conventional conflict. Now, China has also made these nuke threats. So, for instance, beginning July 2021, China threatened to incinerate both Japan for its expressed support for Taiwan, as well as Australia for joining with the U.S. and the U.K. in the AUKUS Pact. Periodically throughout this century, Chinese generals and political leaders have made unprovoked, unprovoked threats to destroy American cities. March 10th last year, the Chinese military said that they would impose the quote-unquote worst consequences for any country that came to the aid of Taiwan. Now, these two aggressive states, China and Russia, are working together because they think that their interests coincide. They both want to take down the United States, and they also want to take down the existing international order. So we have seen both of these countries work together in very close proximity, and they both have grand territorial ambitions. Vladimir Putin wants to annex neighbors because he wants to reconstitute the Russian Empire. And Xi Jinping wants to annex the world and the near parts of the solar system. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it sounds ludicrous, but no, I'm not exaggerating. So with regard to planet Earth, on July 21st, 2001, Xi Jinping gave a speech to mark the centennial of the founding of China's ruling organization. And he infamously said that he wanted to crack skulls and spill blood. But he said something even more chilling and significant. He said this, quote, the Communist Party of China and the Chinese people with their bravery and tenacity solemnly proclaim to the world that the Chinese people are not only good at taking down the old world, but good at building a new one. And these words mean that Xi Jinping wants to reimpose the Chinese imperial era system where Chinese rulers believe that they not only had the mandate of heaven to rule Tianxia, or all under heaven, but that heaven actually compelled them to do so. So China is not competing with us within the existing international order. It doesn't even want to, as many people will say. It does not even want to actually um, adjust that order. It wants to overturn it altogether. And that means China is once again revolutionary. And Xi Jinping and his officials have been saying quite clearly, and I'll give you an example. Wang Yi, foreign minister, then foreign minister, now China's top diplomat because he was promoted. In September 2017, he wrote an article in Study Times, which is the Communist Party's uh, newspaper. It's in the Central Party School. And in that article, Wang Yi wrote that Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy and a thought in Communist Party lingo is an important body of ideological work. Wang Yi wrote that Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy, quote, made innovations on and transcended 300 years of Western uh, diplomatic and international relations theory. Well, if you take 2017, and you subtract 300 years, you almost get to 1648. So Wang Yi, with his time reference, was pointing to the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, which established the current international order of sovereign states. So when Wang Yi says that Xi Jinping wants to transcend that system, what he's really saying is that Xi Jinping doesn't want sovereign states, or he doesn't want any more of them than China. That's our planet. Re with regard to the solar system, since 2017, Chinese officials have been talking in public about how the moon and Mars are sovereign Chinese territory. In other words, part of the People's Republic. And that means they consider those heavenly bodies to be like the South China Sea, 
theirs and theirs alone. And that means that they will exclude us from going there if they get the opportunity to do so. And we do not have to speculate because Chinese officials say that in public. In 2021, in April, Beijing announced its Mars rover. And Beijing said, well, its Mars rover is named Zhu Rong. And of course, that's appropriate. Mars got a fire. Yes, it all makes a lot of sense. But what Beijing didn't say was that Zhu Rong is also the god of the South China Sea and the god of war. God of war? So is Xi Jinping going to plunge the world into war? Unfortunately, he already has. It's apparent that he greenlighted the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year. And that's evident from the 5,300 word joint statement that Russia and China issued when Vladimir Putin went to Beijing to meet Xi Jinping on February 4th. That's the statement that said that China and Russia were in partnership, a no limits partnership. And that was just 20 days before Russia invaded Ukraine. And those are not just words, because since that invasion, we have seen China has continued to provide Russia with the resources to prosecute this war. And that means we're in a, living in a very different world. Now, a lot of Chinese officials are obviously uncomfortable with Beijing's full-throated support for Moscow on the invasion of Ukraine. But it doesn't appear to make a difference. The reason why is that China right now is run by a strong man, and that strong man is ignoring everybody else. Now, unfortunately, we have seen the strong man rule is inherent in the Communist Party's system. Now, the era of the current strong man, General Secretary Xi Jinping, has been marked by a return to totalitarianism and sometimes erratic rule. And in that regard, it actually mimics the era of China's first strongman, Mao Zedong, who founded the People's Republic. Mao turned what was supposed to be a regime run by a committee into a regime run by one man. And with his power, he then embarked on ruinous campaigns like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. And Lyndon, you'll be interested in this. Deng Xiaoping, who was um, Mao's successor, started to normalize Chinese politics. He did that by institutionalizing norms, guidelines, rules, and understanding. And foreigners were just ecstatic because they saw that China had meritocratic rule. But in a Mao-like grab for power, Xi Jinping has reversed that process and has deinstitutionalized the Communist Party by grabbing power from everybody else. And this means that we have here a lot of people say, oh, you know, Mao Zedong was just an aberration. China has become normal. Well, strongman rule is evident in the first years, in the first decades of the People's Republic, but it's also evident now under Xi Jinping. So the question is, will Xi, like his hero Mao Zedong, um, change China in a way that nobody wants except for Xi? And certainly, will he take China over the edge as Mao Zedong almost did? Well, right now we are seeing a China that is very different from what everyone had hoped it would be. And what we are seeing are two things. First of all, it's now become evident that China is a militant state that identifies the United States as its enemy. And second of all, it's become very clear that we are no longer deterring China. And I'll talk about these two points. On the first one, the Communist Party does not try to hide its animosity towards the United States. Matter of fact, it often goes out of its way to tell us how it feels. So, for instance, in May 2019, People's Daily, which is the most authoritative publication in China, carried a piece that declared a, quote-unquote, people's war on us. That's a phrase that comes from the Mao era. 
And this hostility is evident in Chinese propaganda almost every day. Now, we Americans, by and large, have chosen not to see what the Chinese are saying about us. And when we do notice, many times our foreign policy analysts, they just seem perplexed. But they shouldn't be perplexed because the Communist Party treats the United States as an existential threat. And it treats us as an existential threat, not because of anything that we say or do, but because of who we are. An insecure Communist Party worries about the inspirational impact of American values and America's form of governance on the Chinese people. Now, why do we care about how the Chinese look at us? After all, one can say, well, this is just merely propaganda. But we got to remember that with its strident anti-Americanism, the Communist Party is laying the groundwork as a justification for striking us. As James Lilly, our great ambassador to Beijing in the 1980s and the 1990s said, China always telegraphs its punches. Second, it's clear that deterrence is breaking down. And it's evident from what the Chinese continually say about us. This was clear, for instance, in August 2021, as Afghanistan was falling to the Taliban. China was making the case that the United States was incapable. On the day the Taliban took over the capital, Global Times, which is not official, but it's semi-official, it's used by the party to signal propaganda notices um, and the drift of Chinese thinking. In that day that Kabul fell, the Communist Party and the Global Times were talking about how could the United States possibly stand up to a mighty and magnificent China when we couldn't even deal with the ragtag Taliban? Global Times ran an editorial that said this, referring to us. Quote, it cannot win wars anymore. And the Global Times actually talked about Taiwan and said that when China invades, not if, but when China invades, two things will happen. The island will fall within hours, and the United States will not come to help. And in the following October, Global Times carried an editorial, which basically is the thinking of the Communist Party, and it had this title, quote, Time to warn Taiwan secessionists and their fomenters, colon, war is real. Now, China's political system looks like it's become militarized, but there really is no mystery as to this. In 2012, when Xi Jinping became general secretary of the Communist Party, in other words, China's ruler, the party was highly factionalized and divided. And Xi Jinping became the number one guy because he was the least unacceptable choice. <laughs> That's a great way to become China's leader. But it's not a great way to rule in a factionalized system. And so what Xi decided was that he needed a political base. He needed a faction of his own because he didn't have one. So what he decided to do was to make certain flag officers to be the core of his political support. And that means the generals and admirals have now put their stamp on Chinese diplomacy and they're taking a greater and greater share of the central government's resources. So, for instance, last year, the Communist Party announced that the military budget was increasing by 7.1%. Maybe true, maybe not, but that's what they announced. At the same time, they announced that the economy would only grow 5.5%. And everyone knew that that was unattainable. And in fact, the Chinese economy, according to the official National Bureau of Statistics, we learned this just a week ago, the Chinese economy grew 3.0% last year, but in reality, it contracted, which shows you that the Chinese military now has a greater and greater stay, say over what's going on in the central government. Now we see China's military spending growing so fast that it has essentially overtaken strategy. And we hear the generals and admirals, they are talking about what they can do not what they should do. We're also seeing the military become much more influential in civilian life. 
So for instance, in the beginning of 2021, amendments to China's national defense law took power away from the civilian state council and they handed it to the Communist Party's Central Military Commission. And these amendments facilitated the mobilization of China's civilians for war. In July, a Chinese entrepreneur who was making products, medical products for the civilian sector, told me that he had been visited by central government officials who demanded that he convert his production lines to make items for the Chinese military. Communist Party officials have been giving similar orders to other manufacturers. And indeed, my friend mentioned that there are so many f factories now are actually being run by the Communist Party that were once privately owned because those owners gotten um, similar orders and they decided not to stick around for Xi Jinping's war. Now, Beijing's foreign policy has always been tightly bound to domestic political intrigue. But that's been especially true in recent years under Xi Jinping. Now, Xi, as I mentioned, inherited a consensual political system where no leader got too much credit or too much blame because decisions were shared across the, the top of the political system, the Politburo Standing Committee and the Politburo. So everyone was in on a decision. But Xi Jinping grabbed power from everybody else. And as he did so, he also grabbed accountability. And at the same time, he inherited a political system where if you lost, it was no big deal because you got a nice house in Beijing. Xi Jinping changed that system and he started jailing his opponents, among other things. So Xi Jinping now knows he has total accountability and he knows the consequences of failure, which means that he has, I believe, a very low threshold of risk. At the same time, I think that Xi Jinping is seeing a closing window of opportunity to achieve what he considers to be historic goals. And we can see this because China is now beset by simultaneous crises. Continuing debt defaults, plunging property prices, contracting economy, worsening food shortages, deteriorating environment, and of course, the fast moving COVID-19 outbreaks, which this winter probably will infect more than 1 billion Chinese, and probably, if the modelers are right, will kill somewhere between 1 and 2 million people. Now, on top of this, there's a slow-moving crisis, and that's demography. China is now 1.41 billion people. It probably will lose something on the order of 8 billion people this century, between now and 2100. That means it'll be, in 2100, about the third of the size as it is today. China, which is now four times more populous than America, by the turn of the century, they'll be lucky if they have 30 million more people than we do. This is the steepest projected demographic decline in history in the absence of war or disease. The collapse, of course, started last year, which officially is the first year of population decline since 1961, year of the Great Leap Forward, the Great Famine. Many demographers in China think that the population has actually been declining since about 2018. Why is this important for us? Well, in the 1960s, Mao Zedong started the Cultural Revolution because he wanted to do away with his political enemies at the top of the Chinese political system. And now Xi Jinping has basically the same incentives. But Mao Zedong did not have the power to start a global war. But Xi Jinping certainly does. Xi now has full accountability. His domestic policies are falling apart. His foreign policies aren't doing very much better. He knows he's in trouble. And that means we're in trouble. So the question is, well, what do we do? First thing we have to do is acknowledge, as President Biden did in March of last year, that the international order is changing. Yes, it is changing because it's dividing with China and Russia and its proxies on one side and the rest of the world on the other. President Biden, of course, doesn't want to acknowledge that, but we can all see that it's happening. 
So we need a grand strategy, and here in a few moments is mine. First thing, we need to cut off the blood supply to those who mean us harm. And that means, and I know people will find this to be drastic, but it means we need to sever trade and investment. We need to stop. We need to stop all the technical cooperation, which means we're giving China some of the world's best technology for free. Now, I believe in free markets, but China for decades has been the world's trade criminal. What it has done, it has, it has not obeyed the trade rules. It has not complied with its obligations while everybody else did so. And if we want to defend the world's free trade architecture, we're going to have to impose costs on China for doing that. Because if we don't, that free trade architecture will fall fast, as it looks like it is doing now. Second thing, we must deter China. And the where this is the most important, of course, is the Taiwan Strait. For decades, the United States has had a policy called strategic ambiguity, which means that we don't tell Beijing, we don't tell Taipei what we would do in a conflict. Now, this strategy worked. It's worked for decades. But it worked in a period which was benign. And we no longer live in a benign period. So I believe that we need to take certain steps. We need to hear President Biden get behind a microphone in the Oval Office and tell the world that the United States will defend China. And we, this time, do not need the White House press secretary contradicting him. <laughs> We need to hear our president say that we will recognize Taiwan as Taiwan if they want to. We need to hear Biden say we will offer a mutual defense treaty if Taiwan wants it. And I think that we should also preposition weapons in Taiwan and maybe even base a tripwire American force there. These are things we did not do last year. And the result is the war in Ukraine. Now, people will say, those are risky things to do. And I agree, they are risky. But to say something that is risky now is not meaningful because everything is risky. Because of decades of misguided China and Taiwan policy, we have created a situation where every option is dangerous. But I believe that the most dangerous and risky option of all is to continue with policies that created this mess in the first place. So why would we want to defend Taiwan? Well, first of all, for more than a century, going back to the 19th century, in fact, we Americans have drawn our Western defense perimeter off the coast of East Asia and Taiwan's in the center of it. We need to defend Taiwan because China is attacking democracy, not just our democracy, but attacking democracy in general. And we cannot allow the Chinese to absorb any democracy, especially one as important as Taiwan. But there's another reason. With the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan, Taiwan has now become the test of American credibility and resolve. We angered and disheartened our friends following the fall of Kabul. We cannot afford to do that again. And we have to be concerned that as Russia pressures Ukraine and fights a war there, that China will think that it can fight a war in East Asia. So we have to rebuild our defenses. We have to reestablish deterrence. And we do not have a moment to lose. Now, my lovely wife says that I need to end on a positive note. <laughs> and after 29 years of marriage, I learned not to argue with her. So, how about trade is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow learner. So here goes. This is my personal optimistic story about another time when dangerous figures were trying to remake the international order. And it starts with my dad. My dad arrived in this country shortly before the end of the Second World War. He had gotten a scholarship from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, so he got it, hopped a plane, flew over the Himalayas to India, 
From there, he boarded a Liberty ship that went all the way down to Australia to avoid Japanese submarines, and then came back up and landed not far from here, in San Pedro, port of Los Angeles, in February 1945. He then took the Transcontinental Railroad, went to Ithaca, New York, Cornell University, got his degree, his master's in civil engineering in 1946, and in the meantime, the world fell apart, at least if you were Chinese. Mao Zedong took over the country, but a generous America allowed my dad to stay. So what did my dad do? Well, he took his master's in civil engineering and he opened a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> he did this like a four table restaurant in the garage of his home in dilapidated Keensburg, New Jersey. And guess what, folks? It failed. So my dad went to plan B, which was to actually use his engineering degree. He worked for the public utility in northern New Jersey. But on the first day that he was eligible, 55, he then took early retirement, and he went out and started a Chinese takeout in Madison, New Jersey. And from there, it grew to a restaurant. And from the restaurant, he took the profits and he bought a building, renovated it, and triggered the rejuvenation of the town center in Madison. Now, my dad never missed a day of voting. My dad also never missed an opportunity to tell my three sisters and me, all four of us, by the way, went to Cornell. So yeah, I am the prov product of an Ivy League education, but don't hold that against me. Um, so, um, my dad never missed an opportunity to tell my three sisters and me how great America is. He would always say, China was his birthplace, but America was his home. So my optimistic message to you is that I learned from my dad that this is not only a great country, but we are a great people. So, thank you. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.